So there was a baptism happening in church, and it was the baptism of a baby. And this priest, you know, took the baby and had a little beautiful little silver pitcher and was pouring it over the back of the baby's head, baptizing and blessing this baby. And five-year-old Emma watched intently from the pews. And she saw the priest saying some very important sounding words as, as the priest poured this water over the baby's head. And then she leaned over to her dad and she said, Dad, why is Pastor Bob brainwashing that baby? <laughs> so what is baptism? I mean, I'm sure if you talk to some people, they will say it's brainwashing. It's just, you know, your mind is, is basically you have to consent to a doctrine and then you walk around going, Jesus is Lord, Jesus is Lord, Jesus. And you're like, you lose your personality. You just, you know, you're constricted. You become judgmental. And that's what happened. But that is not what baptism is or what it's intended to be. Baptism is a public declaration of our faith. It's a declaration of the new birth that we receive in Christ. It's a public declara declaration, kind of like in a marriage. You know, in a marriage, I mean, the foundation is two people who say, I love you, you love me, we're going to live together, we're going to make a family together. That's the foundation. But then when they make it public and they make that public commitment and they join in word and in spirit and action, then it, it is solidified. It becomes a thing. It becomes something where God is moving in it, partnering with that couple to bring it about, to bring the vision and desire of that partnership into fruition. So this also happens in baptism. I mean, the heart of it is that we choose to love God, to serve God, to repent of our sin, to renounce evil, and to follow Christ. And we can do that without being baptized. But there is something very important that happens. We partner with, in word and action with God. We put a ring on it in baptism. We say yes. We make it public. We offer an opportunity for the Holy Spirit to move in that, in that ritual, in that moment, in our vows, in his grace. to make it something that serves as a foundation for our whole lives. Baptism in that way is like a wedding ring. It's a public declaration of an inward commitment. It's something that can give us strength and joy for each day. We're doing this series on divine design. We've been working on it for a couple, uh, probably a couple of months now. Different elements that are part of the core divine design that God has for us as people and as a church. And it comes, I was inspired to do this because we recently, as a congregation, partnered with the Christian Church Disciples of Christ, which is a small denomination. It actually was the first church founded on American soil. There were lots of other churches that came here. You know, there were Anglicans and Presbyterians and Lutherans that had been founded in Europe. There were 
Um, there were others that came and then started branches here, and there were other churches that started later. But the Christian church, Disciples of Christ, was the first one founded on American soil. And the goal was unity, was finding that common ground that Jesus prayed for. He prayed. There was one place in the Gospel of John where he says that all He prays that all his disciples would be one. He says, even as you, Father, and I are one, that we would all be one. And so part of what Alexander Campbell was one of the the founders um, of this movement, and it didn't start as a denomination, of course, it was just a goal to bring all Christians together. And that's why it's called the Christian Church, disciples of christ and they deeply studied the scriptures he had been a presbyterian Uh, when he came here he went into uh, a time of intense study to look at what are the core elements the core components of what it is to be church to be christian and baptism is one of them There are two sacraments, two holy rituals that are celebrated by every church of every denomination, whether it's Quaker or Catholic or Ethiopian or Russian. Every different church in every part of the world celebrates two holy rituals, two sacraments, sacred movements. Communion is one of them the holy feast that Jesus invites us to that table every time we gather. And the other one is baptism. Baptism, and that is the, again, this public declaration of our faith. It's throughout the scriptures we see that that baptism is always done at the age where a person can say, yes, I want to be baptized. There are, there are dedications of, of children, and sometimes we do a baptism of a baby or a child, which is the parent's faith. It's the parent's commitment saying, we recognize that this child is a gift of God. We love this child. We want this child to grow in faith. And so they baptize and dedicate that baby. But the baptism that the Bible teaches about is that one where someone is old enough, mature enough to make that decision themselves, to say, yes, I want to follow Christ. I want to be part of God's family. I say, yes, I renounce my sin. I repent of it. And I am stepping into this new life. And then baptism is that public affirmation of that inward commitment. The, as I mentioned, the goal of this movement of the Christian Church Disciples of Christ was to come back to the earliest tenets of what it means to be church and to find unity there. But there was a tension between the earliest tenets of the church and the desire for unity. And that tension continues to exist. And it exists in, at first it arose particularly through baptism. Because all churches honor and celebrate baptism, but Alexander Campbell was like, well, we should only do the biblical way of baptism. So they didn't recognize, you know, the Catholic or Lutheran or Episcopal ways or Presbyterian of baptizing babies. It was like there there have to be, it has to be something that someone is old enough to confirm themselves. And so then that led to attention and schisms and differences. And we have this tension in the church of whether we are, whether our core goal is this unity 
that Jesus prayed we would accomplish or whether it is returning to the earliest traditions that we see Jesus practicing. In the, in the contemporary Christian church, Disciples of Christ, there's they, they, the approach is basically everyone and every way of doing baptism is welcome, but believer's baptism is strongly encouraged <laughs> as a biblical model. And, uh, and the baptism of of babies is welcomed, but then we also look toward where they, as a young adult or an adult, can confirm that baptism for themselves. This creed was, or this, um, this uh, what is it, a saying, I guess, not a creed, was raised up in essentials unity, in non-essentials liberty, in all things charity. So this is the way that we seek to approach baptism, that baptism is essential, but exactly how it takes place, we have charity and grace around it. There are five things about baptism that are really important to what is happening in baptism. And particularly, we see, again, in, as in the story we heard today, believer's baptism. Today we heard the story, and this is, um, Philip had been actually, before what we heard today, he had been baptizing lots of people and uh, there was a whole movement of the spirit that was happening and this was happening simultaneously to the persecution that was ramping up against the early church just before chapter 8 and in chapter 7 of the book of acts stephen had been stoned to death he was a man full of the spirit and proclaiming the gospel freely and joyfully and he his life was taken from him i was struck as i reread it again he was while they were stoning him he kneeled down and prayed right in that moment lord please don't hold this against them he was baptized stephen the martyr was baptized not just something that happened once years ago, but he was baptized in the Spirit right in that moment. You can see the forgiveness of Christ is flowing in his heart, in his mind. He is free of resentment. He is free of self-centeredness. He's not like, oh my gosh, I might die. He was definitely going to die, and he did. But he just was so focused on prayer and love for God even in that horrific situation because he was baptized and living out that baptism. The word baptism literally means immersed. This is where, again, we can see in the, from the biblical perspective, the sprinkling or pouring of water is something that the church began doing later just for convenience because obviously if all your clothes are wet it makes it hard for you to you know you have to do something about that you can't just go through the rest of your Sunday and so you know it was simpler to do um, to do a little bit of sprinkling and it's obviously symbolic so so the church in many different denominations decided to uh, to begin doing sprinkling but the word itself baptizo it actually comes directly from the greek it, it wasn't even they didn't uh translate it they just created a new word from the greek because the word means immerse if you were saying in greek i am washing my dishes you would be baptizing them you're putting them under water and then bringing them up So this baptism that 
that happens throughout the scripture is a baptism that occurs one time in a ritual form in water, but it is a baptism of being immersed in the Holy Spirit, in the love of God, in the presence of God, in the power of God, in the capacity of God to move in you and through you. Baptism is not just something that happens once. It happens at a particular moment in a ritual so that you have that as a touchstone, so that you have that as a place of accountability, as a public proclamation, as a celebration, as an opportunity for the Holy Spirit to pour out. But it's not just that one moment. It is a life, a lifestyle, an experience that we are meant to live out and live into, to be immersed in the Holy Spirit, immersed in God. And we see this in Stephen when he was martyred. And then persecution ramps up. Paul, formerly known as Saul, still Saul at that time, starts going door to door, rounding up anybody that says they're followers of Christ, taking them, throwing into, them into prison where then they can be brought before the elders' council and flogged or excommunicated. So persecution is ramping up, but so is the power of the Holy Spirit. And in fact, it was that persecution that led to the scattering, led to believers and followers being going out all over the ancient Near East, not just staying in Jerusalem where the persecution was the worst, but actually going out and spreading the gospel. So Philip is up in Samaria. Lots, he preaches, lots of people believe, he baptizes them. And then an angel comes to him, tells him, go to the road between Jerusalem and Gaza. And we don't know how, that, how he hears that angelic voice. Maybe he was deep in prayer, just like, okay, God, what's next for me? Sometimes when there's all kinds of craziness, as was going on in Jerusalem, we can become focused Hopefully that's not what it takes to get us to focus on listening for God. Sometimes it is. <laughs> but certainly when things are difficult, that can push us to focus. God, what do you want? All of this is happening. What, where do you want me? How can I serve you? So whether Philip was in prayer or whether he was just in that place where his ears were open, the ears of his heart were open to hearing the voice of God, he hears and an angel tells him, go down to that road. The road between Jerusalem and Gaza, the road through the desert wilderness. Go there. Okay. Philip goes. And he, he gets there and as he's there, he sees this chariot coming down the road. Obviously, a wealthy person with a chariot, pulled by horses, with a driver. He's like, okay, God. And the spirit says, go up to that chariot. So he runs over. He starts running along next to the chariot. You know, there's the chariot going along. And he's like, you know, and this person might have been like, get away. What are you doing, you scruffy? And like, you know, but no, this was a divine appointment. The man was reading from a scroll. He had the book of Isaiah there. And he was reading aloud. Reading aloud was the common way of reading. He was reading to himself from Isaiah 53. And Philip hears him. And suddenly, I don't know if you've had this. Sometimes, you know, God is like, okay, do this, do that. And you're like, okay, God. And then suddenly it's like, 
this is why God brought me here. Okay. Something happens. You know, you might get an, an inkling just to stay somewhere a little bit longer than you were planning to, and then someone arrives who really needs a shoulder to cry on, and you're able to give them support. You know, you might get uh, an, just an urge, an inkling, an unction of the Spirit to call somebody, and you call them, and it's their birthday. You're like, God told me to call. I didn't even realize what I was doing. You know, there are sometimes when you get a direction, a movement of the Spirit, you don't know why God is telling you to do that until a certain point when it all comes together. Well, that's what happens for Philip right then because he's running alongside the chariot. Then he's like, man, this guy's reading from the book of Isaiah 53, chapter 53. He's reading the prophecy of Christ. And so Philip says, and I, I think Philip must have been in pretty good shape because he's able to talk while he's running. You know, he's like, do you understand what you're reading? <laughs> And the, and the guy is like, come on up here and explain it to me. So Philip's like, thank you. <laughs> so he gets up in the chariot, and he teaches him. He shares with him that this scripture has been fulfilled, that Jesus came to earth, that Isaiah was prophesying about the coming Messiah, and that Messiah came, and he taught and he did miracles and he loved and he gathered people and he was willing to give his life and when he was turned over to the authorities he spoke not a word he didn't defend himself he didn't try to justify himself he didn't call down the angels he didn't blame others He said, you, you've been listening to what I've been saying. You know who I am. And he was put to death. And by his sacrifice, we have new life. We have new life. We have have new life because of what God did. We don't have to do everything ourselves and try to make things happen. We have new life. This is God's work. This is something that God did. God met us while we were yet in sin. Christ died for us. While we were lost, while we were hurting others, while we were hurting ourselves, God didn't wait till we were perfect. He came right to us right where we are. And then he offers us a choice. He offers us a choice to make a commitment to him, to choose life, to choose love, to choose Christ, to choose a way that is away from greed and self-centeredness and self-preoccupation and and fear and to say yes i see you lord jesus christ as the son of god i receive you as my lord and savior i am happily joining with my commitment into what you are doing in the world baptism is god's work baptism is our affirmation of what God has done. It's us choosing to commit ourselves to the work that God has already done. In baptism, we die and raise up with Christ. And I can see Philip right there saying, look, he died, Jesus died. You see this, this prophecy in the book of Isaiah, that he didn't defend himself, he didn't say a word, he was slaughtered, his life was taken from the earth. 
But who can number his descendants? Who can number his descendants? They are so many. Even on the one day of Pentecost, thousands of people from all over the known world were added to that family. Jesus never had flesh and blood children, but who can number his descendants? Because he poured out his life that we might have life. We die with him and are raised with him. This happens in baptism. Baptism makes us one with the family of God. We are united. We are family. And not only that, baptism is an ordination. There's one minister in the Disciples of Christ that put it like this. Baptism is a new relationship with Christ and a new relationship with our community as ministers. We become part of the body of Christ, and therefore our focus is on ministry, on serving, on loving as Christ. So he's, Philip is there in the chariot telling this, Ethiopian official about the meaning of this scripture that each of us are invited to be his descendants. That God with us, Emmanuel, the Messiah, came, gave his life that we might have new life. And we can, when we say yes to it, then we get baptized, and that's our public commitment. That's the seal. That's our wedding ring. That's that moment when we can remember that day. And so they're riding along, and then the Ethiopian official says, hey, here's some water. Now, this is interesting, too, because I think that was God as well. They're in the desert. I don't know if it was an oasis or if there were happened to be a spring, but they pass by some water, and this Ethiopian official says, what is to prevent me from being baptized right now? Philip says nothing. Let's do it. Let's do it. You want to do, you want to get baptized right now? You can do it. All that is required is your affirmation. of Christ as Lord, your renunciation of sin, your renunciation of evil, your desire to love and serve God, and then you can be baptized. You will be 100% part of this family. Now, this man is a eunuch. Some of you may not know what that means if you're perhaps young and haven't learned about it yet in school. Eunuchs had a different configuration of their sexual organs based on a decision that either they or someone else had made. And this man, as many of the officials around the Candace, Candace is a, is a term that means Queen, it was the term for queen in Ethiopia. Often the officials around the queen were eunuchs. And he was. And it didn't matter. It didn't matter that he was a eunuch. It didn't matter that he was Ethiopian. It didn't matter that he was just visiting Jerusalem. It didn't matter that he didn't understand the scripture when he was first reading it, but he asked for help. It didn't matter that he, we don't know if he had been a Jew for many years or if he was a God-fearer or if he was just on a pilgrimage of exploration. 
We don't know, and it didn't matter. Everyone is welcome. Everyone. This is, this is the foundation. In the Disciples of Christ, there's, there's a saying, no creed but Christ. No creed but Christ. This is, this is part of, if we can live into that unity, we hear, I know, we have many different perspectives on a lot of things. We are what somebody, I was just at a clergy gathering a few days ago, and one of the pastors there was like, I'm pastoring a purple church. And I'm like, yeah, we're a purple church. You know, we have people who are blue and people who are red and people who are somewhere in between. We have people of all different political perspectives we have people with different views on how we should address various social issues and i think that is powerful and beautiful for us to have a place where we can have real conversations with people who have very different perspectives from us with a shared foundation in christ in christ no creed but christ this is our foundation this is what is required for baptism. This is what is required for stepping into this new life. Is that we say yes to being disciples of Christ. And we are bound together in a desire to make Christ's love real with each other and for others. So when he said, is there anything to prevent me from being baptized, Philip was like, nope, let's do it. So they go down into the water, and he is immersed, even in all of his finery, as the head of Candace's treasury in his chariot, Recently, we went, we went uh, where was it? When we were in Mexico, we went swimming, and then we got in the car afterward, you know, and I got the seat wet, and I was like, you know what? That's just the way it is. I'm sitting here in my wet stuff, and that's what he did, too. He was like, this is more important than worrying about whether I'm going to get this fine seat wet. It's okay. I'm not going to worry about my hair if it's going to be messed up. It's all right. I'm getting baptized. This is a new beginning. And all of what is available to us in baptism is joy. Everything that God offers us in baptism is joy. The foundation that baptism is God's work involves our trust. Our surrender, as Tammy played so beautifully that song, I surrender. When we trust and surrender to God, there is such joy. There's peace that comes from that. There's freedom. When we recognize, when I recognize that I have a choice and then I make a good one, there's joy there too, right? Some of you, I don't know how many of you, sometimes we make choices and we're like, oh, why did I eat that? <laughs> right? Why did I do that? Why did I say that? <laughs> and then, you know, that, that brings kind of the opposite of joy, like dis-ease, right? But there are times when you had a choice and you made the right one, it's like, woo, yes. I said I was going to get up in the morning. When that alarm went off, I didn't press the snooze button. I jumped out of bed. I did my exercise. I prayed. And then you're like, yes, that feels so good. It brings joy, right? When we have a choice and we make a good one, and this is what happens in baptism. We have a choice. And when we make a good one, we can feel, yes, I have given my life to someone who is worthy to serve, worthy to love who I can trust with my whole life, who has my best interest at heart, who is able to do what I cannot do. There's joy in that. There is joy in the freedom that comes from being forgiven. 
This is when we, we die with Christ and we are raised up. Our old person, our old man, as the old saints used to say, or our old woman, the old self that was preoccupied and grumpy and self-centered and scared and unable to do what was needed, unable to forgive. When that old person is buried in the water and we get resurrected as we step up, as we burst out of that water in baptism, there is joy. There is joy in the unity of family. Baptism makes us part of God's family. Baptism affirms that we belong. And that is true no matter what happens. Years later, the church tried to make rules to say you could only be baptized if you confessed a certain creed or you did a certain catechism or something like that. But that was not actually part of the earliest church. They did that because they were trying to make it so not so many people would fall away. You know, a lot of people would, in the moment of a revival, go, yes, I want to be baptized. And then they were like the seed that fell on the rocky ground and, or the thorny ground. And when other cares and concerns or, you know, difficulties came up, then they just fell away. And that will happen to some people, but it doesn't have to happen to you because you are part of the family. And even if it does happen, even if you fall short, even if you don't live up to the desire or the hope that you have when you are baptized, you are still part of the family. And there is joy there. And then finally, there is joy in the ordination that comes with baptism. When you are baptized, you become a minister, a member of the body of Christ. Somebody who is called to make a difference for others. And you will find your own way of doing that as you listen to the Spirit. As the Spirit says, okay, go to this road. Okay, go up to this chariot. Okay, talk to this person. Whatever the Spirit says in your heart, you will find that. And as you know that you are called with a purpose, there is joy. Baptism brings joy. And I love how this passage ends with this Ethiopian official, this eunuch in the court of Candace, who had been baptized right there in the water by the side of the road. He goes on his way rejoicing. Rejoicing. He has freedom. He has purpose. He has clarity. He has love. He has trust in God. This is what is available for you. For you. For you. Amen.